Okay. Uh, thank you, Manos. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, Turam, uh, a new protocol for oblivious RAM uh, in two rounds. Join work with Sanjam and uh, Payman. Uh, so I'm going to start with the motivation. Uh, so the main motivation for Oram is private cloud storage. And uh, so the main problem we have there is that we like to store our files in the cloud without uh, revealing any information, right? Uh, so OK, that's easy. So one solution we can have is we can encrypt our files with a CPA secure scheme. Uh, so that protects the content of the file, but unfortunately, it's not enough. Uh, we want to achieve a more uh, ambitious goal. So we want to, uh, if we observe which files are being accessed, this will not reveal anything about the content of the file. OK, so we like to hide the access pattern where we're accessing the files. OK, and this is what uh, Oblivious RAM gives you. OK, so Oblivious RAM basically is a way to access a collection of files uh, in a way that the access pattern is not revealed. OK. Uh, so let me give uh, an informal definition of Oblivious RAM. So we have an array of uh, n entries. And uh, so what we want to have now is we want to access one entry out of this array, access x. OK? So I'm going to use this ORAM protocol to access this entry x. So this ORAM protocol is going to uh, start accessing a bunch of entries. And uh, then it's going to output uh, a of x. OK? So this is the real world. So in the ideal world, we have, again, we want to access x, but we don't give this x to the simulator. We just, the uh, simulator only gets to see, like, the size of the array, right? And then he gets to perform some accesses in this, uh, in this array, and it outputs something. So now, uh, if the adversary observes just this axis and the axis made by the simulator, he could he soon be able to distinguish which world he is in. OK, so this is an informal definition of forum. Uh, so uh, some, something about existing work. So before, uh, so a naive way to solve the problem is to just access everything. So this is basically to access one block, you need to access like a linear number of blocks. So this is not good. So in 1990, uh, by the work of uh, Rafael Ostrovsky, uh, we saw that we can do that in logarithmic uh, overhead. So if you access, like, to access obliviously one block, you just need to access a polylogarithmic number of blocks, which was pretty cool. Uh, that created a sequence of a lot of works uh, based on this hierarchical framework that was introduced by, uh, by Rafi. And there's a lot of papers since then. Uh, there was another framework that was introduced in 2011 uh, in Asia Creed by C. San Stefano Ferli, which is a, a tree based uh, framework. Okay, and uh, this, is a little, this is fundamentally different than the hierarchical one. And uh, again, there were a lot of papers since then. Uh, so, tree based approaches for Oblivious RAM seem to be leading to more practical implementations. So, in particular, a, with a tree-based approach in, with ORAM, there's no need for deamortization of worst-case costs. So everything is polylogarithmic in the worst case. Uh, you can observe up to 100x speed up over hierarchical approaches. And there was actually uh, shown that you can also implement it in hardware. And they, like, a, a secure uh, oblivious RAM processor was, was being built uh, called Phantom. OK. So, so in essence, I mean, seems that the tree-based framework is more practical than a hierarchical one. Okay. Uh, so this work is about uh, non-interactive tree-based ORAM. Okay. Uh, so the problem is that most oblivious rounds require interaction and typically a polylogarithmic uh, number of rounds. In particular, when you do an access, you're required to download, decrypt, do some computation, re-encrypt, upload a number of times. OK, so this creates, naturally, this creates some interaction. OK? Uh, it's not, ours is not the first one that, uh, that does non-interactive ORAM. In particular, uh, it has been shown how you can turn 
hierarchical ORAMs to non-interactive by Williams and Sion in 2012 and by Leon Ostrovsky in 2013. Uh, since they follow the hierarchical framework, the costs are linear in the worst case, but you can deamortize them and make them poly logarithmic in the, uh, in the worst case. Uh, and you can also have non-interactive ORAM by just uh, doing garble RAM directly, uh, but this will have a, a big cost. Okay, so, so motivated by the fact that tree-based ORAMs seem to be more practical than hierarchical ORAMs, we want to build a non-interactive tree-based ORAM. Uh, our worst case costs are poly logarithmic, uh, so there's no need for uh, deamortization, and we use the path ORAM design. Okay, so subsequent to our work, there was also a non-interactive ORAM based on the tree-based uh, framework, bucket ORAM, that's not because we're similar, and ours, I think, is, is, a, is a bit similar. Okay. Uh, so, so let me uh, describe our approach now. Uh, I will start with some path ORAM basics. So the goal is that we have here eight blocks, okay? And we want to access them obliviously. Uh, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna distribute it at random in a tree of eight leaves. Okay, so we just throw these blocks in this tree. They can go into any node. Okay, and now we're gonna keep a position map where it's gonna tell us, look, if you want to access block one, you should start from leaf three and go up the root. And eventually, on this path, you're gonna find this block. Okay, so you want to access block four, you should start from leaf eight, go up, and you're gonna find this block. Okay, so this is what the position map tells you. Uh, okay, so, so if you want to read, for example, block four now, what's gonna happen is you're gonna read this path. Now you're gonna download this path, right, locally. You're gonna decrypt it, and you're gonna read the information. Now the problem is, when you want to write it back, you need to make sure that you change, you change the position of block four, because you don't want to read the same position when you read block four again. This will break security. So what you do is you turn, you pick another random number and you assign block four to leaf three. Okay, and you rewrite this path again. So now block four went up to the root and it can be accessed by just going up from, uh, from leaf three. I'm just talking about uh, existing path RAM now. Okay, uh, so that's how it works. I mean, this is a very uh, simple version of it. Uh, now. So there's a notion of recursion. So this is linear space, so it could work like this, but then we're gonna have to store linear space. So you have to actually do a norm on the position map. So the way to do that is to view this position map as an array of four entries instead of eight, okay? And now you're gonna put that in a different ORAM, okay? So you're gonna, this requires a position map of four entries itself. So you store this data, the actual data on another tree, and now you have another position map. Okay, so, okay, so now let's see how it works. If you want to read block seven, you're gonna go to the first, to the position map you have now, and you say, okay, so seven should fall into the fourth bucket, so I'm gonna be accessing the fourth leaf of the first tree. Okay, so you go there, okay. So you access this fourth leaf, you start from the root, going down, okay? You access the fourth leaf, and all of a sudden, at the second level, you find the entry that corresponds to seven, okay? So you pick that entry, so this is the, the entry here, and this has two values. The left value is for seven, and the right value is for eight, okay? So you're gonna, that means that you need to access leaf six in the other tree. So that's how you continue the execution. So you go down this other tree, and you're guaranteed to find actual, the value for leaf seven, so this is G, okay? So you have a position map for the first tree, and the second, and the, this tree stores the position map of the second tree, okay? So now, what we observe now, the interaction comes from the following thing, right? So you need to access the first tree, 
decrypt the information, figure out what is the next leaf of the other tree, right? And then access the other tree. Okay, so, so that creates the, the interaction. So how can we avoid it? Okay, so let's abstract the problem out a little bit. And let's consider like a, 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 like a more abstract problem that, that captures what I talked about before. So the abstract problem is, imagine you have a sequence of trees, of binary trees, okay? And then every node of this binary tree is some computation, right? So it's some logic and it stores some data and it has some logic, takes some input and it has some output, okay? So, so now what you want to do is you have an encrypted input that you give it, you give it at the first root, okay? And now you also give it a path, a path number, saying that, okay, you should go down the second path, okay? So you execute, you execute the computation here, you provide another output for this node here, and then as you go down this path, you're guaranteed to output the path to be followed in the next tree, okay? So th the computation along this path will give you the path to follow in the next tree. And then the computation along this path will give you the path to follow in the next tree. And the computation along this path will give you the path to follow in the next tree. And eventually, by following the last path, the output of the computation will be spit out by the last leaf. Okay, so this is basically what happening, uh, what's happening with three ORAM. Now, with three ORAM, the, with path ORAM, the data and logic is basically, you know, you, you're just trying to check if this encrypted input matches the data that are stored in its node. And once it matches, there you can figure out the path to follow at the next tree. Okay, so we want to solve this problem without interaction, right? Now this requires interaction because we have to download the paths, decrypt, run the computation ourselves, and then continue the computation from the next tree. Okay, and we only want to leak the public inputs, two, one, and six, which are the paths that are being accessed, and we don't want to leak any information about the encrypted input we give in the beginning. You can think of this encrypted input as the original index we would like to access. Okay, so this is, so if we solve this problem, we can solve, we can do non-interactive three or uh, path or arm. Okay, so let's try to see how we can solve. Let's try fully homomorphic encryption. It's very powerful. So what we can do is we can encrypt the input with a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, right? And then we have the public I input, which is the, the path we need to go down. You run the computation uh, here with a fully homomorphic encryption input, it, it gives you an output, you run it again here, but the output of the fully homomorphic encryption scheme is always encrypted, right? So we expect that this computation will give you the next path to, to access. So yes, it, it's going to give it to you, but it's gonna be encrypted. So it's useless. So the server cannot use it, right? Because fully homomorphic encryption will output the next path to be accessed encrypted. So again, to continue, you'll have to send it back, decrypt it, and say, okay, continue the execution from this path. So fully homomorphic encryption will not work. Okay? So, so one way to do it is, remember we had this, this computation here? We have this computation here. So one way to do it is, we're gonna start computing garbled circuits for this computation on every node of the tree. Remember, each node in this tree stores different data, so the garbled circuit is gonna be different, right? So we need to compute different garbled circuits for every node of the tree. And it's very important to compute them bottom up, right? And I'm gonna say why. So you compute the garbled circuits of the previous circuit that I sent, I showed to you, for the leaves of this tree, for this uh, nodes, and so on and so forth, and you continue like this, right? So, okay, so say we have computed garbled circuits, we have sent the garbled circuits, and I want to do the, ex the execution. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna send the garbled input for the first route, okay? That's gonna execute, right? But then it's gonna output something, either an encryption of the result or of the out or not, but then it's not gonna output the garbled inputs for the next thing, right? We want garbled inputs for the next thing. So, one way to do it is to send the result back, compute new garbled inputs, and execute 
the, the second circuit. Okay, so that's not gonna work. So we need to change the circuit that we garble at its node a little bit. So the way to do it is that was our original circuit that we used to garble. So it had input and output. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna hard code in this circuit the garble labels of the left circuit and the garble labels of the right circuit. These are not garble inputs, these are garble labels. Okay, and now we're gonna also give as input to the circuit the path that is being followed. Okay, so given the path, the circuit now can figure out whether I'm going left or right. Okay, so it can pick basically one of the garble, uh, uh, one of the uh, garble labels, either left or right, and then it can combine it with the out of the logic and it can instantiate these garble labels, turning them from garble labels to, to the garble inputs, right? And then it's gonna output the actual next garble input, right? So there's no interaction now. We just hardcore the garble labels of the next circuits to our current node, and then the, circuit, the next circuit is ready to execute. Okay, and then we also need to be careful because when we get at the leaf, we don't have left and right, so we have to put also the garble labels of the next route, right? To do the computation on the encrypted uh, tree. Okay. So let's see now how the execution will look like. So we have the client that has the first path in the index that he wants to access locally, right? It computes a garble input of these two values for the root of the first tree. This first tree executes and it outputs garble inputs for the right, for its right child. Now the garble inputs are used to, ex to execute this, this last circuit. It outputs the garble inputs for the next root, right? And then it continues, outputs the garble inputs of the left, the garble inputs of the left, and eventually it, it outputs uh, an encryption of the uh, index, of the, of the actual value we're looking for. Okay, so this is, uh, th this is how the basic scheme works, but now there's a problem, right? Now, remember, now I only have here two trees. For this tree, we had to encode the garble labels of the next root to every node of this tree, okay? And of course, whenever we access a garble circuit, it cannot be used anymore, so we have to refresh everything, right? So if we refresh the garble circuit of this root, since its garble labels are hard-coded in every garble circuit of this tree, we have to refresh every garble circuit of this tree, which means that the access complexity is linear because you know, we have to refresh all these garble circuits that are hard, because they hard-code the garble labels of all the roots, right? So that's not good. And the way to solve it is basically to, instead of hard coding the garble labels of the next root, you just pass them as input, right? Okay, so the idea is, okay, initially I used to compute a garble input for the first root by having the first path in the index. Now I'm gonna compute a garble input for the first root by having as input the first path, the index, and the garble labels of the second root. So by having all these three, I'm gonna compute a garble input of the first root, and then I'm gonna keep passing down these garble labels, right? I'm gonna do the computation, but here, whenever I will have now to instantiate the garble labels of the next root, I don't need to have them hard-coded because I just get them as input, okay? And then I do the same here. Note now that the client will also need to, co to give us input the garble labels of the third root, which doesn't exist here because of the picture. And then eventually you get to output the encrypted, uh, the actual encrypted value. Okay, so, so this basically achieves, you can refresh everything now in polylogarithmic time. Okay, you don't have to do this, this linear time computation. 
So the cost of our approach is exactly the cost of path or RAM times k, where k is the security parameter. And this comes from the fact that we have to keep uh, this garbled circuit per node, OK? Uh, so for example, when path or RAM downloads a block of b bits, we need to download this block hard coded in a garbled circuit. Therefore, this is k times b. OK? And one open problem is to remove this multiplicative k. Have like an interactive or RAM without this multiplicative k. I don't know if this is even possible. Uh, OK, so this is the basic scheme. So, so what I present so far is an abstraction of how path or RAM works. And I solved this problem, non-interactive computational, on this sequence of trees. And then I saw that you know, this applies to, to ORAM. OK? So let's talk about the application of this thing, of this non-interactive ORAM to searchable encryption. So let me remind you a little bit what searchable encryption is. Uh, so searchable encryption, uh, we can store a set of n WAD uh, pairs in an encrypted form. And given an encryption of keyword W, we want to return all IDs matching W. And all existing approaches leak a deterministic function of W, which is we call search pattern. OK? So we saw how to conceal search pattern without using fully fledged ORAM, mainly D times log n rounds for search. We use four rounds instead. And our scheme can be potentially practical. OK? So again, I'm going to abstract things a little bit. OK? So if we have uh, the notion of adaptive computation. You have a memory. You give an input x. And what happens is you, know, you execute instructions one at a time. OK? This is adaptive computation. You cannot ex execute things in parallel. So this is one class of computations. And if you just use a normal ORAM for that, you need tn times log n rounds, right? Where tn is the computation. Now, if you use 2 RAM for that, you can do it with TN rounds because uh, you need two rounds per uh, access. OK? This just follows from the, from the previous, right? So now, if you have a non-adaptive computation, here's what's happening, right? So you have an input x. You get the result out. And based on this result, you can compute f, some function f of y. And then you can figure out in parallel everything that you can access. OK? So let's see how we can make this computation oblivious. So if you use an interactive ORAM, you need log m rounds for the first small array, and you need log n rounds for the big array, if you assume that you have an ORAM that can send requests in parallel, right? OK? So now if you use 2 RAM, you can do the first array in two rounds, and the last array in log n rounds. OK? But now we, we want to have four rounds, right? So OK, one could ask me, yes, it's easy to get four rounds. Why don't you use two RAM for the big array? Well, you cannot use two RAM for parallel accesses because you need to refresh garbled circuits first and then uh, execute the next thing, right? So two RAM cannot be used to execute in parallel. Yes. Uh, so basically, the idea is to, small, to store the small array in 2RAM, and then to store the big array in path or RAM, but without the position map, right? And then the position map is computed as this, using this pseudo-random function. And then you, you can do basically everything in parallel. OK? And searchable encryption is a non-adaptive computation, because a small array stores W and the number of keywords documents mapping to it. And the big array stores uh, all this W ID. OK, so to conclude, I presented 2 RAM. It's the first non interactive tree based ORAM. Our cost is k times path ORAM. And I presented its application searchable encryption. It's a four round searchable encryption and potentially practical since we only use 2 RAM for an array of size equal to the number of, of unique keywords. And for the rest, we use just uh, path ORAM without the position map. OK? Thank you very much.